Now we can cut very large gradual circles like this with a half inch wide blade, but when you get into a smaller diameter uh, work pieces such as this, and I, I'm going to cut wood now because it'll speed things up a little bit. Uh, according to the book that I just showed you, I won't be able to cut that, uh, that sharp of a radius. So make yourself a series of relief cuts like that. So that as you make your cut, those pieces will now pop out, uh, uh, out of your way. Sometimes it helps to drill a hole to make a, co a corner, an inside corner. I'm going to cut from both sides. If it's a bigger hole, you can make your turn within the hole. Always remember that uh, the kerf is the slot, you know, that ends up as sawdust. So uh, be sure and saw on the correct side of your uh, uh, layout line so that you're not cutting into your stock. Remember that one piece is the waste stock and one is the good stuff, the good side. So cut on the right, correct side of the line. That goes for woodworking as well. If we were going to cut the head off of a, of a big bolt like this, and we wanted it to be a, a straight cut rather than at an angle. If you just lay it in there like uh, like that, we're going to be cutting at an angle. You can hold that in your vise, lift it up slightly so that the work is perfectly level. And then you can cut through. Also, if you're going to cut round stock from the end, such as this, I would avoid doing it uh, freehand because it's going to rotate on you a little bit. Again, hold it in a vise. I've got it in a vise now. And uh, now it can't uh, roll on you. Keep your fingers back, too. This takes your fingers away, away from the blade, so that's a good method. Remember that we can tilt the table on this saw also to cut at angles. Before you cut, if you have unidentified steel and you're not sure what it is and it, it could possibly be hardened steel which will immediately damage or ruin the blade, check it with a file for hardness. And you can always tell by the sound and the feel whether or not you have hardened steel and this is soft steel. Soft steel will uh, file very easily and with a corner of your file you can uh, see the mark right away. If it resists filing, it's hardened, and don't take it to the uh, bandsaw or you're going to ruin the blade. I saw an awful lot of ruined blades in the high school by that uh, error. I know I'm talking way too much, but uh, I've got all these uh, expensive instruments, so I've got to show them to you. But we're going to talk about blade speed, how to calculate it. The easiest way is to use your uh, Kent Moore uh, tachometer comes with many different attachments. This is made in Germany. The box says Kent Moore, but this says Epic on it. There's a bunch of different tips in here, and the tips will allow you to determine the diameter. Uh, we got rubber tips in there. Uh, uh, to determine the RPM of the wheel. But uh, before we do that formula, let's use this Kent Moore uh, instrument and we'll take a direct reading on it because it's got a wheel right here, you see, so we can take a direct reading. If you have the Sterrett speed indicator, and I used to have one, I don't know what happened to it, uh, some of them have a wheel on here so you could take a direct reading. But let's do that first. Turn the machine on. Be careful because we got the wheel guards off. 
and I'm going to put this right on the edge of the blade, but not on the teeth. Now when I push the red button, that holds the setting, and I'm on the red uh, numbers now, I'm reading about 148 feet per minute. The red is feet per minute. Now I'm going to let go and it'll zero out. There's three different ranges on here. This is really a, an expensive instrument, I think, but I bought it used as I buy everything used. So we know that our uh, surface feet per minute is about 148, depending on the accuracy of this instrument. Now another way, since you're not going to have one of those, I know you're not going to, is to determine the uh, speed of the wheel. And we're going to go with the bottom one because I don't have a center hole in the top wheel. So. Uh, the bottom wheel, uh, if we use our Stuart Warner tachometer, it just doesn't work at all because uh, since we're only going about 40 RPM, I, I don't get a reading there that, that is accurate. It just barely comes off the zero, so I'm not going to use that. Again, the Sterrett speed indicator, if I could find mine, would be uh, just the nuts for that. But uh, we're going to get real crude here, and on the top wheel, we're going back to the top wheel, I painted a line on there. Can you see the line coming around? And since this uh, saw runs at a kind of a slow speed, I just counted the revolutions uh, in a minute looking at my watch as that white mark came around. And I got, uh, I got it written down there, I believe it was 40 RPM. All right, let's go over to the bench. This is the formula for determining uh, blade speed. So it's feet per minute equals the diameter of the wheel times pi times the RPM of the wheel. And we're going to divide the whole blame thing by 12 because uh, we're converting it to feet since the diameter is in inches. So we had uh, a 14 inch wheel. You know what pi is. Not something you eat anymore. And uh, it was 40 RPM. So 14 times pi times 40 divided by 12 came out to 144 feet per minute uh, is what we calculate the blade at and uh, taking a direct reading uh, with that uh, Kent Moore gave us what 148 or 146 or something like that so the two were very close together now why are we wasting so much time uh, determining blades uh, speed uh, I don't know <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm doing it other than it's just something I'm passing on but you, uh, you need if, if in doubt run your blade uh, run your machine at a slower speed I thought I was running this in a neighborhood of 100 but it's about 144 here's another nice little book I don't know if they print it anymore but it's the Sterrett saw guide and it's a uh, hack saws and uh, band saws and even um, uh, hole saws but there's a whole lot of information. That must be about 100 pages. And uh, in just a second now, I'm going to talk about the various uh, speeds for different materials. I'm thinking about going into broadcasting. I'm all ready to go. Back to cutting speeds. In all seriousness. Here are some of the common materials you're going to run into daily. Uh, aluminum can be cut anywhere between a thousand and three thousand. That's why you can actually cut thin aluminum on a, a wood cutting bandsaw with a skip tooth blade which is really like a woodworking blade. Uh, brass in the 700 to 1500 range again there's uh, hundreds of alloys of brass. Cast iron 100 to 150 and coal roll steel which is what uh, most of us are going to cut is in the 150 to 200 range so I'm right in that range with my bandsaw. And remember that uh, for general purpose sawing where you're sawing all kinds of uh, different uh, shapes and sizes and, uh, and uh, types of materials you need just a universal speed. So anywhere around 100 up to about 200 is going to handle it for uh, without changing blades and without constantly changing the speed on the machine and, uh, and uh, taking up extra time that is, uh, uh, is not really enjoyable. Now in the next segment I'm going to talk about uh, blades, different kinds of blades, and how to choose a blade when you uh, order them. 
I want to talk a little bit about selection and ordering of bandsaw blades. Uh, when you open the catalogs, it's going to be kind of baffling because there's many pages of blades and there's, uh, of course, different sizes and different materials and different prices and uh, different pitches and all of these different things. And uh, uh, some of what I'm going to tell you here will be useful to you, but uh, you can also just call up the company such as uh, MSC and say, I want to talk to the bandsaw blade man and uh, he'll make all the decisions for you. Uh, just with a few questions that he'll ask you. So if you uh, just want to do that, you can turn this off. If you want to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the details on blades, uh, why listen up. First of all, I would avoid buying bandsaw blades by the coil, that is by the hundred foot requiring welding together. Now some of you are going to email me right away saying, oh no, I can weld them and I do a good job, and some of you probably do. But unless you have expensive equipment and experience, you're going to have a lot of failures of the welds and it's a, it's a big disappointment to uh, break a blade or break a weld in the middle of a job and have to start over. So uh, I've had different uh, welders in the school shop and the dual saw, saw always had one mounted on the machine itself and I, I never thought that was satisfactory so I bought an expensive one, a standalone unit. And uh, really, I was the only one that could use it. You just couldn't get a student to, uh, to do it properly. And annealing the, the weld, I think, was the biggest uh, problem. Some of you might braze them, and if you're able to do that, go for it. But I buy them strictly uh, pre-welded bands, ready to install, to, and they are the right length. Uh, and they guarantee the welds. I had a bandsaw blade salesman tell me something once when I tried to order by the foot. He said, Mr. Peterson, let us weld them for you. We've got a man that does nothing but weld blades all day long, and we got a $5,000 welding machine, and why do you want to mess with it? And so I took his advice, and that was like 35 years ago, and that was really good advice.